welcome back to another Higher Ground News production of our End Times Insights and Current Events class for this week. Today we are going to be talking about Maitreya, we're going to be talking about SHARE International, the Global Peace Plan, and the Council on Foreign Relations. So buckle up, stick with us, and we're going to get started in just You a are second. following me in your notes. We're on page one. And also we have another scripture, 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, you know, I hear so many people, they're so discouraged with all of the things that are happening. But Christ tells us that these things are going to have to happen um, before um, his return. He is preparing the way for his return. His heart is that no one has to um, suffer the eternal consequences of a life without him and a life without having accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. And if, if someone can be drawn to the Lord, uh, through the things that are happening because they can't make any sense out of it, then I hope that's what happens. They see these things and they're thinking, what on earth is going on? You know, maybe I need to get to know this Jesus that I keep hearing people speaking about. But what we want to talk about on page one is the difference between reality versus paranoia. Now, um, I have put in your notes that you need to learn the difference because it could save your life. Did you ever think about that? If you don't understand what Scripture says about some of these events and things that are happening, you might be one of these people that are just swayed to and fro with any doctrine of the wind. and that You don't want that to happen to you. So let's talk about this. And the difference between reality and paranoia is not based on whether or not an idea is unthinkable or something couldn't happen. The difference is based on whether or not there are credible facts and reasonable logic that support the fears or support the concerns. That would be the difference between reality versus paranoia. Now let's give you an example here. Um, on the bottom of page one, if a Jew in Germany in 1939 was afraid that Germany was heading for a degree of anti-Semitism, that could result in something like the pogroms of Russia, that was a very reasonable fear. And I put a definition of the word pogrom in your notes. Um, for those of you that don't have notes, it is a violent riot aimed at massacre or persecution of an ethnic or religious group, particularly one aimed at the Jews. Now that's that definition. Now you're going to see me turn the pages in my notes, so that's what I'm doing. I'm following along with you so that we don't get off, off um, track here. Now, um, at the top of page two, I have a little uh, notation. Although the Nazi death camps were unthinkable, and most people thought that nobody would ever do such a thing, they did, in fact, exist, and they killed about 12 million people six million of them being Jews, and the rest being primarily political dissidents. Now what Hitler did was far worse than the Russian pogroms. But if a Jew in America in 1950 was afraid that there was growing anti-Semitism and the American government would do something similar to the Russian pogroms, well that was considered paranoia. It just wouldn't happen. In the America of 1950, such things were more than unthinkable. They would never have been done under any circumstance, and the public would never have allowed such things. Now, in considering whether something is a reasonable fear or just paranoia regarding America in 2016, that's the day that we're living in. We need to see whether or not there is credible evidence and whether or not reasonable logic based on that evidence could give rise to reasonable concerns or fears. 
And let's not forget, we need to think in terms of the America of 2016 rather than the America that we grew up in. How many would, of, of you would agree that America has changed? This is not the America that I grew up in, but sometimes we get stuck in this mindset of looking th at things through the perspective or the lens of the America that we did grow up in. But that's not reality. We live in a world of complete moral decay, along with current and impending forced vaccinations, RFID chips, and the never-ending discussions regarding FEMA camps. Now, out of those three issues, we have seen forced vaccinations. We have seen RFID chips being um, inserted in people's hands. People are just running towards that, like it's just the greatest thing since, you know, sliced bread. The only thing that we haven't seen in those three uh, particular topics are the FEMA camps. But we hear more and more and more about them. Is that reality or is that paranoia? Well, I'm going to let you be the judge of that. We've had many, many classes discussing these uh, different events. So you just um, do some research and you be the judge of that. But let's go ahead and switch gears. And now we're going to reflect back for just a little bit on one of our previous lessons in our Series 4 that I did. It would be found in Lesson 18, Part 2. And it is on pages 1 through 2. And that, that particular class was taught in October the 12th of 2014. And this is very important for the days that we are living in now. We were talking about the men of Issachar, 1 Chronicles 12.32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the, head, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Now, according to the Hebrew Bible, the tribe of Issachar was one of the tribes of Israel. And in David's day, the men of Issachar possessed understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. They could interpret changing current events in light of the unchanging plan of God. Want me to repeat that? They could interpret the changing current events, that's what's happening still today, in light of the unchanging plan of God. Now, they saw through the temporal problems to the eternal solutions that lay in back of them. They saw the timeless principles of God's character, ways, judgments, and unfailing prophecies and they discerned the hand of God behind the acts of men and nations. Listen to this now. Because they were separated from the lukewarm majority, and their vision wasn't clouded by the popular cravings and cries of their time. So what does that tell you? You know, the Lord says we are set apart. If you're a Christian, he tells us that we are to be set apart. And also, you know, if you continually hang around people that have no desire for cross, for Christ, have no desire for his word, your, your total views are going to be clouded by things that they will say. You need to really draw yourself close to Christians and to the word of God. Now, consequently... Because of what they did, they looked beyond visible events to the invisible God who controlled all things for Israel's good. And this penetrating vision enabled them to tell the Israelites where they stood, what was coming, and how to prepare for it. And isn't that exactly what the scriptures tell you in Ezekiel? They say, if you see trouble coming... You need to warn the people. You need to tell them what's going to happen. Because if you don't, the Lord's going to hold whatever does happen to that person on you. He's going to hold you accountable for that. But he says in his word that if you do warn them, 
and they still choose to continue down the same path, then he won't hold you accountable to that. So what are you doing? You're kind of trying to tell people where they stand. You're trying to tell them what's coming. And you're trying to tell them how to prepare for it. And at this particular point in um, our walk with uh, the Lord and in the world today, the most important thing right now, and as this is common and always has been, is for people to really accept the Lord Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. But even above that, for Christians, they really need to examine their lives and start getting it in line with the Word of God. None of us are perfect. But we can all use a little self-examination from time to time, right? And just take a look at our life and where we have fallen short, repent, get back to the Lord, and then go forward from there. So let's continue going. Um, we're at the bottom of page four. Where are our sons of Issachar today? We have many pollsters, but few prophets. Many status, statisticians, but few seers. And our leaders see, but few see through. Many are intelligent, but few are insightful. Where are those who can discern perplexing church, national, and international problems? Are you one of the sons of Issachar? Would you be considered that? Well, A.W. Tozer um, is, who was the exceptionally gifted 20th century writer, preacher, and prophet, wisely noted his and our generation's need of spiritual insight. We need the gift of discernment again in our pulpits. The anointed eye, the power of spiritual penetration and interpretation, the ability to appraise the religious scene as viewed from God's position and to tell us what is actually going on. See, he recognized that there is a need for that type of person. There is a need for people that have that spiritual insight and also um, the ability to look at different things that are going on and just keep them appraised of that. And for himself, uh, Tozer prayed, we're at the top of page five, Lord, give me sharp eyes, give me understanding to see, and courage to report what I see faithfully. And that would be my prayer as well, that I have the understanding to see and the courage to report what I see faithfully. How many of you know that when you're going to be the bearer of not quite so good news, it does take some courage? to let people know about that because you never know how it's going to be received. But the Lord didn't tell us, you know, to warn people of trouble coming as long as they would like what you were going to tell them. He flat out told us we are supposed to warn people, period. We're supposed to do the warning because if we don't, he's going to hold us accountable. Now, as um, kind of uncomfortable as that may seem, we're still supposed to do it. And sometimes it does take courage to do that. Now, uh, remember, the word says, do not be deceived. And that was the first thing that Jesus said to his disciples after they questioned him about the signs of his coming and the end of the days. And this same warning was brought forth by his apostles throughout the New Testament, and rightly so. So, we are going to start looking um, at... Maitreya now. We're at the bottom of page five. So here's where we're going to start connecting some dots. If you do have your notes, you see some little tags that are alongside of some of these um, uh, 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 statements and insights. And I've done that purposely so that you can kind of sort of go through there and just follow it if you're doing a quick review of your class and then start uh, connecting those dots. For number one, we're going to look at Maitreya, and who is Maitreya? Well, Maitreya is known as the world teacher. Some of you have heard of Maitreya, some have not. But whether you have or whether you have not, he is no stranger to the world community. Now, here's another little tag. Maitreya is endorsed by the Aquarian Age community, known as the AAC. And the AAC supports spiritual work of the United Nations. 
now. We have talked about the United Nations many times in some of our past lessons, and the AAC is a meditation group connected with the Lucius Trust, which was known originally as the Lucifer Trust. Now, we studied that as well. The Lucius Trust has consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations and is recognized by the Department of Public Information at the United Nations as a non-governmental organization. And in your notes, I've put some additional links uh, so that you can have look up some, some of that information for yourself if you'd like. Let's go to the top of page six, and we're going to look at uh, Share International. That Now, Share International is the website that really promotes Maitreya, and um, it is also endorsed by the United Nations. And on their website, it reads, in the very near future, people everywhere will have the opportunity to witness an extraordinary and significant sign, the like of which has been manifested only once before at the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Soon, once again, a star-like luminary of brilliant power will be seen around the world. Well, let's take a Look at the mission statement of the AAC, and we're going to start tying some things together. We live in a time of unprecedented opportunity. The dawning of the greater and lesser cycles of Aquarius have been awaited by the hierarchy of light and love, the masters of wisdom, the teachers of humanity for untold millennia. It is a time when millions within our human family will have the opportunity to make a leap in consciousness, realize their spiritual potential, and actively cooperate in the restoration of the plan of love and light on our planet. They go on to say that in support of that externalization process, the Aquarian Age community, quote, cooperates and collaborates with the worldwide community that is actively preparing the way for the reappearance of the world teacher, the Christed, anointed one, the true Aquarian. But um, in your notes, I have please make absolutely no mistake. The Christed does not refer to the biblical Christ, but is only one of the names used to reference an awaited world spiritual teacher who is also called the Lord Maitreya, Sanat Kumara, the Imam Mahadi, and the Buddha Histava, whatever it is. I don't know how to pronounce it. But this is demonstrated by the final note on the page, which, which says the Aquarian Age community is dedicated in loving service to humanity, the planet, and the great thinker. It is inspired by the teachings of Master Kut Humi, Master Moria, and Master Dijual Pool, as these are set forth in the books of none other than Helena Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, and the Agni Yoga Society. Now, in our previous classes, you do know, or if you don't, let's just reflect back and remember that Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey were the direct influence over um, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations for 40 years. Do you remember that? And out of that influence, many, many things were developed, one of which was the Common Core. Remember that? Yeah. So those are some and dots And we are right going there. to continue. We're on page seven in your notes. And at the top of the page, we're going to be talking about Maitreya. And um, according to this Share International, he has been expected for generations by all of the major religions, which was kind of news to me because I really didn't know that much about him. And I consider myself Christian. 
and it says Christians know him as the Christ and expect his imminent return. Jews await him as the Messiah. Hindus look for the coming of Krishna. Buddhists expect him as Maitreya Buddha. And Muslims anticipate the Imam Mahdi or Messiah. And although the names are different, many believe that they all refer to the same individual, the world teacher, whose personal name is Maitreya, preferring to be known simply as the teacher. Maitreya has not come as a religious leader or to found a new religion, but as a teacher and guide for people of every religion and those of no religion. Now, I think all of that sounds really, really interesting, and it certainly um, kind of sort of takes my thoughts into this universal one world religion that Christ talked about and told us about a long, long time ago. Now, let's continue going. At this time of great political, economic, and social crisis, Maitreya will inspire humanity to see itself as one family. Now, we're hearing a lot about that all over the place now. And create a civilization based on sharing economic and social justice and global cooperation. Mm -hmm. He will launch a call to action to save the millions of people who starve to death every year in a world of plenty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't that sound familiar? Does any of those things sound like anything you've heard anywhere? It sounds a lot like the things I've been hearing. Among Maitreya's recommendations will be a shift in social priorities so that adequate food, housing, clothing, education, and medical care become universal rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've been hearing about that. Under Maitreya's inspiration, humanity itself will make the required changes and create a saner and more just world for all. Oh my goodness me, if that doesn't sound like a carbon copy of the things that we are hearing under the um, phrase of sustainable growth, we have to be able to make sure to sustain everything so that we can sustain our world. And in order to do that, we have to make a lot of changes so that we can, uh, can sustain the growth. And everybody is just going to be doing really well. We're all going to be sitting around the table holding hands singing kumbaya. Can't wait for it, can you? I don't think so. Not me. So let's go up on page eight. The United Nations is connected with the Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah, I went right to their website, and my goodness me, right there they have the United Nations chartered plastered all over it. You can find it. Go for it. go there for yourself. And remember, what is the purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations? It's to bring about one world government. It's highly involved in all the financial matters all over the world. Do you know if you try to look them up in history book, you're not going to find them anywhere in the history book. But um, they are highly involved in all the financial matters and also uh, in bringing about one world government. Now, the Council on Foreign Relations is also a Jesuit ruled organization. That's interesting. And on the bottom of page eight, I have down there, it is interesting that the Council on Foreign Relations is a Jesuit ruled organization, considering the Jesuits are what? The military order of the Catholic faith. We studied that in, um, I believe it was series two. It was all about Catholicism and all the uh, intermakings of that uh, faith and the beliefs and the Jesuits and everything that had to do with Catholicism. I think we it was about maybe 25 weeks that we spent on that. If you couple that information with the fact that Pope Francis is attempting to bring everyone into a one world religion, 
and the goal of the CFR is to bring in one world government, then you have a most interesting connection. But the most interesting connection of all was when I started thinking about the Council on Foreign Relations and all the things that we had were looking at earlier uh, in this lesson. So I thought that it might be interesting to take a look at the membership roster of the Council on Foreign Relations. And I was specifically interested in determining if, determining if there were any of our religious leaders among their members. And interestingly, I did find someone, and that someone is Rick Warren. Now, is he aware of what the ultimate goal is to bring about one world government? I don't know. I'm going to let you determine that based on the facts. Um, it is a public uh, website. It is public knowledge who their members are. You do have to apply to become a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I do know that um, Pope Francis is very much promoting this one world uh, religion where everybody uh, is is going to come under uh, the, the the one world government. That's what we're seeing. Everything's okay. Um, and especially coupled with the knowledge that it is a Jesuit ruled organization, I just found it interesting that he is among their members. So, you know, I don't know. You can make your own decision. Um, but why does Pastor Rick Warren need to be a member of the Council on Foreign Relations? Why would he? I don't know. And will he play a role in the emerging church and ultimately the universal church? Well, we're going to cover those questions in our next lesson. So make sure you stay tuned and, and join us again. And we closed this class with this scripture, Second Chronicles 20. 6 through 17. I think that may have been 7. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's what Christ tells us. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Isn't that something? I mean, God's right there with us. And in spite of all these things that are happening, it didn't catch God by surprise. It shouldn't catch us by surprise. All we got to do is be reading, our, reading the Bible, get into the Word. He's the one that told us about all these things that were going to happen. We are blessed that we get to sit back and actually see these things being manifested right in front of our eyes. And oh my goodness, it's like the words are hopping out of the page right in front of us. What a blessing that is. And no matter what you may feel, the Lord still says, do not be afraid. In fact, he says, tomorrow, go out against them. For the Lord is with you. So I hope you've enjoyed this class. Um, come back and uh, catch us next week. And we're going to continue on this study. All right. Thanks so much and God bless.